Good afternoon again. Welcome to today's webinar, Traveling Texas Roads, The Legacy of Roadside Parks. My name is Jennifer Carpenter, and I'm a historian with TxDOT's Environmental Affairs Division. I'm joined today by TxDOT landscape architect Sandra Chipley, historian Renee Ben, and Jason Dupree, the director of maintenance. Today's webinar will explore the young work of a young immigrant from the Netherlands who pioneered the look and use of Texas's roadside parks. We'll also dive deeper into the status of these parks and share how you can be a part of TxDOT's historic preservation progress. Process, excuse me. Though things are slowly returning to normal, many of us at TxDOT are continuing to telework and navigate the virtual world. We appreciate your time and attention today and hope that the webinar goes out goes off without a hitch. But before we begin, a little bit of housekeeping. The webinar does include PowerPoint presentations. So if you are joining us by phone, we can get you a copy of the presentation upon request. If you have any questions at any point during the webinar, you can type them into the Q&A box found on the right hand side of the screen. You can also enter questions in the chat and send them to the host. We'll make sure to answer all your questions at the end of the presentations. And finally, the webinar is being recorded and it'll be available on the TxDOT website following the presentation. Our agenda today will include a quick overview of TxDOT's historic preservation program and ways you can get involved. We'll then move into the presentation from our three panelists. We'll have questions at the end and we'll wrap everything up and finish around three o'clock. Before we begin, I did want to call your attention to our new web page all about the roadside chats here. You can check out any sessions you may have missed and look at upcoming sessions. You'll also see we've got some topics here that we will be covering in future months. So do check back with that and make sure you're keeping up with what we've got going on with the roadside chat program. I'm sure when you hear the words text dot and transportation, images like this probably come to mind. When we talk about our work, we hear a lot from people that they think text dot creates construction delays and traffic problems. But you know that text dot's actually responsible for some pretty amazing discoveries. For example, the Texas Highway Department discovered the inner space caverns in 1963 when conducting drill tests. Or did you know that our preservation efforts help maintain old buildings like this one, the U drop in along Route 66? Projects like these demonstrate how TxDOT's work goes beyond the road. Our planners, engineers, environmental scientists, archaeologists, and historians thoroughly review projects and consider questions like, will this project disrupt, disrupt quality of air and water, create higher noise levels, put endangered plants and animals at or negatively impact a community and its resources. Our environmental work happens before any construction even begins. It's part of the work TxDOT does every day, but many people don't know about it. One cool example shown here on the screen is um, an ocelot using a wildlife crossing that TxDOT built across a busy, busy highway. The crossing helps protect the endangered species and other animals that call South Texas home. You can read stories like this and watch videos about similar projects at text.gov keyword beyond the road. And while this information may be new to you, teams of historians, archaeologists, and environmental scientists have been doing this work for a long time. In fact, TxDOT's archaeology program is officially over the hill. As of last year, the program has been examining sites that are significant to Texas for 50 years. In 1970, TxDOT was the first agency to conduct permitted archaeology in Texas, and before that, projects were completed through private researchers. Since then, we've dug up tens of thousands of cubic feet of dirt and uncovered some pretty amazing stories. The work we do is the work conducted by our archaeologists and historians is guided by federal laws like the National Historic Preservation Act and the National Environmental Policy Act. These laws require us to stop, look, and listen for cultural resources before beginning construction on a project. Driving down Texas roads, you can see evidence of our state's heritage. 
Roads are lined with old and interesting bridges, buildings, and scenic landscapes. In our line of work, we call these cultural resources. Another way to define cultural resources is to think about the historic places and spaces that make your communities unique. Cultural resources can include historic buildings and bridges, archaeological sites and cemeteries, sacred or religious landmarks and sites, and historic objects and landscapes. Addressing cultural resources concerns is one step in TxDOT's environmental review process that all projects go through before construction. It's part of what we do that goes beyond the road. Cultural resources is just one of several types of resources we study. And such work is one piece of a bigger program that looks at a host of environmental impacts during project planning. But just because a building, bridge, or other type of structure is old doesn't mean that it gets preserved as is. Preserved has a different meaning for us under the regulations, as does historic. For a place to be considered historic, it must be at least 45 years old and have a documented connection with a historic event or notable person or exhibit notable architectural or engineering design. If such a place sees criteria, it's considered historic and can be listed in the National Register of Historic Places. Should a place that is proven historic be negatively impacted by construction, TxDOT must find a preservation outcome, and that can happen in a lot of ways. It's always decided in consultation with our partners. Making up for these negative impacts to historic and archaeological sites is called mitigation, and through mitigation, we can save the stories of these places for future generations. And when we find unique stories, we want to make sure we share them with you. So we create brochures, short videos, podcasts, posters, and more as part of our outreach and education campaign called Beyond the Road. But that's not all. Part of our program involves you, the public. Working with the public has helped us learn more about the cultural resources that are important to you. So we invite you to join with us, voice your concerns on projects, and help us brainstorm new ways to mitigate. We hope that you will get involved. For more information, you can visit our website and again use the keywords beyond the road. While TxDOT's historic preservation process is governed by laws and regulations, we have the opportunity to, to, to tailor our process. We do this by creating agreements with our federal and state partners that will detail how we will complete our work. TxDOT is currently updating our programmatic agreement. This agreement will determine how, when, and what resources we use during our historic preservation process under Section 106. Once a draft of the agreement um, becomes finalized, our partners sign off on it and it becomes legally binding. Updating the programmatic agreement will improve the effectiveness of our historic preservation process by increasing the number of projects that do not require in-depth studies. Our goal is to instead focus on bigger projects that might negatively impact cultural resources. Plus, increased efficiency saves the agency, and by extension, the public, time and money. We've got more information about the updates to our programmatic agreement to come. We hope that you will want to learn more. Remember, public involvement is at the heart of preservation. Your voice matters. And if you want to help TxDOT with the preservation of historic sites, but you don't know where to start, we've got more good news. Soon we'll be, we will be unveiling our very first Road to Historic Preservation virtual training platform. The site's going to include several training modules so you can get involved in preserving our state's historic resources. We'll provide more details about the training platform in the coming months, so make sure to stay tuned. In the meantime, you can visit our website to learn about what's going on and learn more about our preservation process. And with that, I'd like to move into our presentations for today. We're gonna to start with Sandra Chipley, our landscape architect. So Sandra, when you are ready, please take it away. Good afternoon. As Jennifer mentioned, I'm Sandra Chipley, and I'll be presenting the first portion of our presentation. 
to gain a better perspective, um, hang on just a second. I'm going to get used to a different kind of way of changing the slides. Um, so to gain a better perspective of the history of Texas roadside parks, a good place to start is by exploring the biography of the landscape architect who designed, oversaw the construction, and promoted them. His name was Jacobus uh, Jack. He went by J-A-C, Jack Gubbles. Um, so let's begin. Jack Gubbles was born uh, in 1896 in Holland, which today is known as the Netherlands. He immigrated to America and became an American citizen. He made his home in Austin, Texas from 1928 until his death in 1976. And here's some of the information we'll be covering. First, let's take a look at his formative years. Jack Goebbels was born in Kroningen uh, in Holland in 1896, as I mentioned. His parents were Johannes Jacobus Goebbels and Finn Groman. When he was 12 years old, he wrote an essay on parks and came to the attention of the local public works director in his hometown of Groningen. The director encouraged him to study at a school of botany and art in Groningen for about a year, from about 1912 to 1913. From there, he went on to study landscape architecture in Germany at various schools, uh, Bielford, Westphalia, Hanover, and Frankfurt. This is a contemporary photo of the school he attended in Bielford. Goebbels was 20 years old when he returned to Holland from Germany and boarded a freighter for Padan, Dutch Sumatra, where he worked as an administrator and in plantation site selection for coffee and quinine plantations. In 1922, his employer began to have some financial difficulties, so Goebbels decided to return to Europe to complete his studies. In June of 1923, he married a young woman from Northern Germany, Margaret Newman. Unfortunately, he found himself lacking in funds to complete his studies in post-World War I Europe. So a few months later, they sailed to New York, starting their married life together as immigrants in America. The newlyweds arrived in the Port of New York aboard the Van Damme in September of 1923 with Goebbels' uh, occupation listed as planter and his wife's as housewife. Although Goebbels relayed in various interviews over the years that he initially worked for a landscape firm in New Jersey upon uh, his arrival in the United States, his ship's arrival manifest from his immigration voyage indicates his final destination was Grand Rapids, Michigan, and his contact there was at W. Lechniette on 436 Nolligan Avenue. The 1922 Grand Rapids City Directory shows William Plechniak, who was the superintendent gardener of the Edward Lowe estate, today known as Home Dean Manor and Gardens. William and his wife were also born in the Netherlands or Holland, William and Lee Varden, and his wife, um, maybe coincidentally, in Kroningen. The Lowe's Gardens were in fact designed in 1922 by the renowned landscape architect, Ellen Biddle Shipman, who uh, was out of New York City. And this may be the connection with New Jersey. Uh, that's the closest thing I've found is perhaps that was the link. But back to the Lowe Estate Gardens, the conceptual design for the original estate plan had been completed years earlier by O.C. Simons. In later years, Goebbels referred to as having been hired to design an alpine garden in Michigan in 1923. So from historical records, it appears he may have been hired by Lachniet or the Lowe's or maybe even Shipman to detail out some of Shipman's planting plans for some portion of the Lowe's gardens. At any rate, the project was brief and by the end of the year, Goebbels moved to Denver where he assumed a full-time position with the firm of Sacco R. DeBoer and M. Walter Pessman. Thirteen years older than Goebbels, Sacco R. DeBoer was born in, and I have a hard time pronouncing this, I'm not sure, at Yurchirp 
in the Netherlands. He had his own landscape office in Europe uh, before immigrating to America due to severe bouts of tuberculosis. And he came uh, first to New Mexico and then moved on to Colorado. Tabor became the city of Denver's second landscape architect in 1910 and opened his own Denver design office in 1919 in partnership with M. Walter Pessman, who you see here. DeBoer spent a portion of the year 1922 studying city planning in England. And interestingly, a ship's manifest shows DeBoer returning to Denver from Rotterdam in September of 1922, almost exactly a year before Goebbels' immigration voyage. DeBoer's partner, Walter Pessman, was born in 1887 in the Netherlands in the village of Thessing near, well, really, it's right just outside of Goebbels' hometown in Kroningen. He had immigrated to Colorado when he was 19 years old, also after a bout of tuberculosis, and he graduated from Colorado A&M in 1910. It's interesting to consider where all these landscape architects and planners were coming from to ply their trade in the United States. So let's take a look at this map of Northern Europe. Uh, you see over on the right, this is all Germany, and here's Belgium, here's the North Sea, and the Netherlands, and all of them are from up in this northern portion of the Netherlands. Here's a closer look at the area, and in the bottom right-hand corner, you see what 10 miles is uh, on this Google Earth map, so you can kind of get an idea of how close these uh, these guys had uh, where they were from, how close to each other they were. So um, Jack Goebbels is from Kroningen right here, and Pessman is from Thyssing here, and then De Boer is from Eurotrip, and then Lachniette is from um, Leeuwarden. And Lachniette's wife, remember, was also from Kroningen. So there's a possibility they might have, some of them might have even been related to each other. <clears throat> this, this slide shows the dates of DeBoer's businesses and of uh, Goebbels' employment with DeBoer. And as you can see, the DeBoer and Pessman partnership was dissolved in 1924, but Goebbels remained with the DeBoer side of the business. In divvying up um, the contracted work, Pessman took the contract uh, with the Denver Public School System to prepare landscape plans for 70 schools. And SR DeBoer and company, city planners and landscape architects, moved into an office next to DeBoer's home. In all, Goebbels worked for DeBoer from 1923 to 1927. And during those years, the firm designed the Bonnie Bray subdivision in South Denver, prepared a master urban plan for the city of Grand Junction, Colorado, and DeBoer was named a member of the first zoning commission for Denver. Here's an example of a Denver streetscape designed by DeBoer from the Colorado Encyclopedia.org. And the man in the, the uh, carriage is DeBoer, in fact. And here's an example of one of DeBoer's premier residential designs from the George C. Carlson collection of the Denver Public Library. I find this one interesting because it has elements that remind one of Goebbels personal residence um, in Austin. So the reason I've shared so much about Goebbels' work with DeBoer and Pessman with you is because both partners are today nationally recognized as significant early landscape architects and planners in the Western United States. DeBoer went on to prepare the master plan for Boulder City, Nevada, um, and some state plans for Utah and Wyoming, along with the, Deven uh, pardon me, the Denver Public, um, Sorry, the Denver Botanic Gardens. Pessman authored the famous book, Meet the Natives, on Colorado's native plants. He planned highways for the Colorado Department of Transportation and taught at Colorado State University. And he was also a founder of the Denver Botanic Gardens. Goebbels and his wife, Greta, filed a declaration of intention for naturalization in early 1926 
and moved to Houston, Texas in 1927. So what was the state of landscape architecture in Texas in 1927? Well, 18 years before, George Kessler, an urban planner and landscape architect whose firm was based in Kansas City, Missouri, was hired to design a parks master plan for the city of Fort Worth and a city plan for the city of Dallas. Kessler went on to prepare a master plan for Houston's Herman Park in 1916 and plans for Fort Worth's Camp Bowie Boulevard in 1918. The landscape architecture firm of Hare and Hare, also based in Kansas City, Missouri, revised Kessler's master plan for Herman Park in 1923 after Kessler's death and the Fort Worth Parks in 1925. It's unclear who might have brought Jack Gubbles to Texas, but opening his own design firm was evidently the reason for the move. The year of his arrival, he joined the Houston Rotary Club, and that year he quickly accumulated projects at sites now familiar to most Texans. Gubbles was hired to design and restore the grounds of Sam Houston's homestead on the campus of what um, was then called Sam Houston State Teachers College in Huntsville. Also in 1927, Goebbels prepared restoration plans for the San Jacinto battlefield. This is an interesting photo of the battlefield from TxDOT's archives. If you'll look at the date at the bottom on the caption, um, the photo was taken on the actual day of the 100th anniversary of the battle. By the end of 1927, Goebbels had a contract with the city of Austin to help spend $750,000 uh, park fund issue, principally to select and acquire parkland. As a result of the contracts with the city of Austin, Goebbels moved to Austin in 1928, but maintained an office in Houston. An advertisement appeared in the Houston City Directory in 1929 for the firm of Jack L. Goebbels and H. L. Dunham, you can see here. Um, the advertisement lists the firm's services as landscape architects and engineers, parks, golf courses, home gardens, industrial beautification, town plans, civic design, subdivisions, and institutional plans. I'm still searching for historical records for the elusive Mr. Dunham and for golf courses they may have designed. Their Houston office was in the Niels Esperson building, at that time a newly completed modern high rise. So this takes us to Goebbels' life in Austin. In October of 1928, his firm, Jack L. Goebbels and H. L. Dunham again, was hired by the City of Austin's Parks Board for the sum of $300 a month with one staff member to be available full time. Goebbels opened his Austin office in the Littlefield building in 1930 and remained there until 1932. In the 1930 census, he's living in at 606 West 9th Street and his next door neighbor, surprisingly was the famous, later to become famous, Walter Prescott Webb, who was then a history professor at the University of Texas and with whom he developed a long-term friendship. Examples of the firm's Austin work were the selection of some of Austin's most iconic parkland, Zilker Park and Shoal Creek, the development of Eastwoods Park and Palm Park Playground, and renovation plans for the grounds of the Elizabeth Ney Studio in Hyde Park. In the fall of 1932, Goebbels provided work for the Texas Highway Department on an as-needed basis and on March 30th, 1933, was hired as a full-time employee. So what led up to the Texas Highway Department hiring a landscape architect? Well, in um, the department had been organized in 1917 
And in 1929, Judge W.R. Ely, a member of the Texas Highway Commission, had lobbied Gib Gilcrest, the chief highway engineer, over to his ideals of highway scenic beauty along with tree planting and preservation. A statewide billboard survey was performed by each district in 1929, and in 1930, Gib Gilcrest issued his historic policy memorandum on tree preservation in the right-of-way, which included Joyce Kilmer's immortal poem, Trees. Paralleling the highway department's landscape efforts was the work of women's clubs and garden clubs across the state. The Bureau of Roadside Development was established uh, within the department in 1931. And that same year, the Texas Federation of Women's Clubs Beautification Program, as planned by Gutson Borglum, was outlined at a club meeting in Mount Pleasant. Borglum, as you see here on the right, was a nationally acclaimed sculptor known for his work on Mount Rushmore and was hired by the Texas Highway Department's Park Board to plan for the 1936 Texas Centennial. He, uh, quote, created a statewide plan for highway improvement through plantings of blue bonnets and red buds along the highway, unquote, along with a series of monuments. So, as I mentioned, Gubbles' full-time employment with the department began in March of 1933. He considered his first duty was to enhance the awareness of the public, contractors, and highway engineers of the benefits of beautification. And just a month and a half after his hiring, a San Patricio County newspaper reported that he was marketing a set of conceptual planting plans for state highways for a few miles of planting from each town and mentioned his plans to ask the county to donate an extra width of land for rest areas. It was 1933 and he emphasized the use of native plants as he had learned in Germany and his work in Colorado. And one of the main things he really, really wanted to promote too was that he felt like landscape architects could help make highways less expensive, not more expensive. Many of these first projects included wildflower seeding, tree planting, and erosion control. Funding was approved for the Texas Highway Department to design and place Texas Centennial markers for the approaching 1936 celebration of the 100th anniversary of the emergence of the Texas Republic. This is when the first state boundary markers were designed and installed. Here's a quote from a Dallas Morning News article that appeared in 1936. The Texas program of roadside improvement has done much to make every Centennial Road a scenic trail that will leave visitors with pleasant memories of Texas landscapes. Gobbles had encouraged cities to adopt an appropriate plant species to symbolize their communities. Palestine chose dogwoods, the valley chose palms, and this appears to be when Tyler chose its rose. Some of the Centennial tree plantings survive to this day in different parts of the state. After a young Linda Baines Johnson was named the first Texas director of the National Youth Administration in 1935, the youths worked closely with Gobbles and the Texas Highway Department to construct roadside parks. Interestingly, Johnson's office was also in the Littlefield Building in Austin, and this too began a long a lifetime friendship between LBJ, Lady Bird Johnson, and Jack Gobbles. In 1934, Goebbels um, launched a series of at least 12 volume publications on subjects like suggested plantings, improvement of roadside parks, highway safety, and roadside design. And this continued on for about 16 years. TxDOT's archives has copies of some of these booklets in the series, but would like to locate originals or copies of the remainder. During those early years, he was often referred to, or Goebbels was often referred to as a landscape engineer. His staff included two office assistants and a secretary, 
And as landscape design staff was added, they were assigned to four regions of the state. By 1941, they're um, located in in specific districts, um, the highway department districts, and they were referred to as roadside developers at that time. Terms like turnouts, roadside parks, overlooks, and arbors were coined to define differing types of roadside improvements. Turnouts were usually for one picnic table and or a historic marker. The volume on roadside parks included drawings of four typical layouts, and these designs conceptually address the relationship uh, between the uh, roadway and um, drainage and um, the fixtures, um, sorry, the or what we call site furnishings today. So, for instance, the typical layout number one is on the left, and it shows the roadway. Uh, on the left, and you would turn out of the roadway and park over in this area. So it was a turnout and it was protected by a median, a planted median. They also suggested posts or slabs of um, stone in this area to keep people from driving into the picnic area. Um, these are picnic tables and benches and fire, uh, what they refer to as fireplaces. And uh, there were stone walls or timber walls in these areas and entry plantings and exit plantings in those areas. If you look at the bottom of this particular page, you'll see that there's a section. We just looked at a plan view of that. And then this is a cross section of the road and the park. So um, in this particular one, the road and the park are all at the uh, pretty much level and at the same elevation. In typical layout number two, it's referred to as entrance at heavy cut. And if you look at the, the uh, section at the bottom, you'll see the roadway was much lower in elevation than the park. And so you were um, the roadway cut through that hillside here, but you would drive up to the park area, the roadside park area. Typical layout number three uh, was kind of the opposite of the last one. The roadway was on a much higher elevation than the, um, than the park itself. It was at a lower elevation. And so you had a ramped driveway down to a, a circle drive where you would park with a planting in the middle. And so some of the plantings were located right here. And then typical layout number four is really considered an alternate of, of layout number one where you had too many, not too many trees, but you had more trees there and you didn't want to disturb the existing vegetation. So you, uh, they, you wanted less of an impact on the site. So it was the same kind of circle drive where, that you parked in and with the planting. And it, and it, it, as you see the section at the bottom was really still more at a level area, but it might've also had a drainage or show a, a drainage pipe or culvert in here. These roadside parks provided a welcome respite for the traveling public in an era before fast food and air conditioned motor vehicles. The highway department's landscape architects included improvements around some existing springs for fresh water for both humans and their vehicles, and even included at least one botanical garden. Here's their, their sketch for a uh, roadside spring. And here are a couple of their construction drawings for two types of picnic tables. Like the sustainability guidelines of today, they encourage the use of native and local materials, shown are both stone and timber um, tables and benches. And the stone ones were usually uh, used more in West Texas with the, the wooden ones in East Texas. Brush arbor shelters and overlooks were often used with roadside turnouts in scenic areas. The brush was usually Georgia cane. The term arbor continues to be used today to identify the steel shelters in TxDOT safety rest areas. The design and construction of the Davis Mountains Scenic Loop was a project that the Highway Department's landscape architects took special pride in developing. It was a highway designed specifically for the traveling public with majestic views and mountains and valleys that demanded turnouts and overlooks in roadside parks. It was referred to as a mountain trail and provided work for the CCC 
and was meant to encourage destination tourism in a sparsely populated area of the state. The trail's construction was coordinated with an upgrade of the landscaping and expansion of the parking lot at McDonald Observatory, which had been built on Mount Locke just off the scenic loop. Jack Cobbles authored this book, American Highways and Roadsides. It was published in 1938 by the Houghton Mifflin Company in Boston. It established him as a nationally recognized expert in highway safety and roadside design. And, and it included an introduction by Julia Montgomery, who was the Texas State Highway Department engineer. Also, it was promoted by his friend, Walter Prescott Webb, who had first suggested he pursue the project. The book included photos of our Texas roadside parks, along with other drawings of typical roadside improvements. Here's some planting statistics from the first five years of Gubbles' employment at the Texas Highway Department. So that's 1933 to 1938. Um, they had sown 80 tons of flower seed, 100 tons of grass seed, and they had planted 500,000 trees, 700,000 shrubs, and 200,000 vines and perennials. <clears throat> Jack Gubbles left the department in 1947 to establish his own planning and landscape architectural consultant firm. And here's a recap of his career at the highway department. When he was uh, hired to work out in 1933, it's interesting to kind of note that his salary was $225 a month. Um, but by 1940, he was the head of the Roadside Development Division, and he served in that for two years until the beginning of World War II. And in World War II, a lot of the landscape architects uh, and other staff with the highway department uh, joined the military effort um, to win the war. And um, so, and, and funds weren't really that available either. So um, they moved the landscape architects that were left into an urban planning group, and he was the director of that urban planning group. After the war, uh, they reformed the landscape uh, division, and he was the head of the landscape division uh, in 1945. And as I mentioned, he left in 47. Interestingly, Goebbels became the landscape architect for Texas, for the highway department, Texas Highway Department at the same time that Walter Pestman had held that position for the Colorado Highway Department. Jack left the Highway Department for a contract to plan school sites for the Austin Independent School District and became an urban design consultant for many cities across the state. His exposure to uh, school and urban design planning with DeBoer and Pestman, no doubt, provided him with the experience to find his own place in TxDOT's landscape architectural history. And oh yes, he did become a naturalized citizen in 1936, our centennial year. I'll end my portion of the session with a few staff photos from our TxDOT archives of Jack Goebbels and some of those first transportation landscape architects who brightened our highways. Here's a quick bibliography along with some photo credits. And it's maybe not so quick, but that, that is it. And if you would like to contact me, here is my information. And now uh, Renee Ben will provide you with a more detailed look at the roadside parks themselves. Thanks, Sandra. Um, hi, this is I'm Renee Ben, and I'm a historian with TxDOT. And I'm going to take you on a photo journey of the history of Texas roadside parks today. Among thousands of parks originally built, approximately 500 remain. Here you see a map of those larger rest areas and information centers in the state. With this many assets, six years ago, TxDOT sought a way to assess whether these roadside parks were historic or significant enough to be listed in the National Register. TxDOT undertook a study with consultants Mead and Hunt, which resulted in TxDOT's Texas Roadside Park Study, which is posted on our website.
Most of us cannot imagine where early travel along Texas roadways must have been like. No air conditioning, no Whataburger, no Bucky's, and no rest areas. Roadside parks evolved from early stopping points along the road, like those shown here. The photo on the left is from somewhere in the Brownwood area, and the photo on the right is near Big Bend. All of the photos in this presentation are taken from TxDOT's photo library, which is located in Austin and is available to the public by appointment. The Texas highway system has been a national leader in mileage and road quality for many years. Since the early 1930s, Texas has proudly featured its roadside parks and rest areas as a focal point of its road system, serving both day-to-day -day highway travelers and tourists visiting the Lone Star State. The design, materials, and overarching philosophy behind the construction of these resources were closely linked to prevailing state, state and national trends, both in park design and highway design. Roadside parks and rest areas are distinctive resource types, merging highway engineering with park-oriented design and landscape architecture. The study of Texas historic roadside parks and rest areas provides a unique viewpoint from which to illustrate the history of the state's highway network. During the Great Depression, several factors led to the construction of several hundred roadside parks around the state. These factors included the idea of naturalistic park design, the ample availability of work relief labor from New Deal programs, a push for highway beautification and roadside improvement, and preparations for the 1936 Texas Centennial. Parks built during the Depression tended to use stone masonry or timber for their features. They were designed to blend in with the surrounding area, providing restful stops for picnics and relaxation. This photo shows an early turnout with a lone picnic table and grill. This was in Williamson County along what is now Interstate 35. Sandra spoke much about the Depression era parks. You can read here some of the features of those parks. The photo shows a turnout that was located along State Highway 65, about three miles south of Gilmer, which featured a centennial marker. Folks could take refuge in the shade and rest of it during their long, hot travels. This slide so shows construction using local materials in the Piney Woods, one of the hallmarks of the early roadside parks. And here we have that in place in a park in Sims in Bowie County. As far as we know, this park no longer exists. Uh, here's an early example of incorporation into the landscape. A tree is a centerpiece with a rustic fence defining, defining the back of the park at the right. This was in Northeast Texas near Atlanta. During the Texas Centennial in 1936, the Texas Highway Department, or THD as TxDOT was then known, prepared for an influx of visitors to the state by building information stations on highways at or near state borders. Here's a couple of photos of the information sta stations dating from that era. Uh, they definitely encapsulated regional architecture of the time. We wanted to show you a few of these as they date from an interesting era in the state's travel and tourism industry. Here we have a couple of colonial revival examples from Denison on the left and from Bowie County on the right. Colonial revival seemed to be mo the most popular style of the type. Here is one that was located in the center median of US 77 in Gainesville. Here's a Pueblo revival style information station from Glen Rio on the left and a similarly southwestern styled station that was on US 81, now Interstate 35 in Laredo. I had done some looking into these resources in my work researching historic highways. These are photos I took in 2013 of one that had been moved to a field off US 90 in Orange. As you can see, it was pretty ravaged by time, even before we surmise it became a victim of Hurricane Harvey. We don't think there are any more left, but they, they may have been repurposed. Do you think that there might be any in your community? If so, please let us know.
Hope you enjoyed that slight detour about the information stations. In the next era, the World War II period was a low one for official new roadside improvement, including the construction of roadside parks. Policies created during the Great Depression to keep people in work and economies moving were no longer necessary as young men went to war or went to work for the war machine. As Sandra mentioned, several of uh, the THD employees did go to work for the war effort. This period is marked by maintenance and the increased role of community groups taking their larger role in highway beautification and tourism due to lack of government money. This photo shows a park from this era that reused natural resources. Leftover large rocks from the gravel borrow pit used to build the roadbed became an arbor and picnic area. Here's another 1940s era photo. The use of faux bois or concrete made to look like wood in the San Antonio area. The THD strive for a natural look and feel even when using concrete in this park. The park also demonstrates the hiring of local artisans. I haven't fully researched to see if we could find out more about who constructed this park, but it's similar to artist Dionisio Rodriguez's work in the area, including in Brackenridge Park in San Antonio. Limestone for these resources was readily available in the region. THD built a roadside park at the intersection of Highway 87 and 97 in 1936. And you see here on the right, the plan set showing concrete table and chairs at the north end of the park, indicated by the red arrow. Uh, the plans also identify an NYA marker and flagstone curbing as shown by the green arrow. This park no longer exists. This is a sort of transition slide as I wanted to show you how THD planted the only trees one sees for miles in the harsh landscape in the late 1940s. This was 26 miles west of Fort Stockton. After World War II, the Texas highway system experienced rapid growth, but lacked the inexpensive work relief labor funds that had been available before the war. THD efforts instead focused on the rapid expansion of primary highways and farm to market roads, while THD publications indicate little interest in new construction of roadside parks or other roadside improvements, construction history indicates that a small number of new parks were built in this period. The main focus of roadside improvements was the reconstruction and replacement of parks from the Depression. These post-World War II parks utilized new standard plans and featured more modern designs and materials. In the early 1950s, picnic table sets were built with smooth brick and concrete, while roofs were usually corrugated asbestos and framed with angular or tubular steel designs, creating some of the most iconic roadside parks in Texas, such as those seen here near Big Bend. Scenic overlooks were built during this era. A scenic overlook is a roadside park or turnout constructed in response to the natural environment or exceptional scenery or views visible from the overlook. Here's a scenic overlook on the left, which features the integration of the site with its setting. Uh, it is perched rather pre precariously on a cliff, but allows for great views while picnicking. It was near Mountain Home along Texas Highway 27 in Kerr County. The one on the right is on Loop 375 west of El Paso near Franklin Mark Mountain State Park. The construction of the interstate highway system and other limited access freeways brought the next generation of Texas roadside parks. THD began building safety rest areas along its interstate highways in the early 1960s, generally using national guidance for their construction. Safety rest areas were designed for driver safety and efficiency in terms of rest area layout and spacing between the rest areas. Rest areas took on a more linear appearance for easy access both to and from freeway lanes with long exit and entry ramps to the freeway. Built features in both the rest areas and roadside parks continue to look more modern, reflecting broader architectural and design trends. Here's a mid-century example showing integration of site and setting, where the flat modern style building and arbors contain mid-century design elements, but manage to blend in with the rather flat surroundings between Round Rock and Georgetown. You can also see the long exit ramp from the freeway in the background. This one clearly does not exist today. This mid-century rest area was located about 10 miles east of San Antonio. 
This one also featured those 1950s angular steel designs in the picnic table arbors. The photo on the right was taken in 1963. By the early 1970s, the THD's most used rest areas featured comfort stations, a polite term for toilet facilities, and info boards displaying tourist information and highway maps. After the flurry of safety rest area construction in the 60s and early 1970s, the THD again shifted focus as it completed its interstate highway program. Highway beautification became more important through activities such as wildflower plantings, litter pickup, and billboard removal. The THD also began a building campaign for new tourist information offices around the state. These tourist centers were generally located at key entry points into Texas. Roadside park and rest area work again focused on maintenance and upkeep of existing parks. Here's a park that again features mid-century elements that blend with the landscape, and you see the comfort station in the background along with an info board in the foreground. This was just south of Fort Worth along Interstate 35. We do have plans for some features of roadside parks, but it's often haphazard as to whether an individual park had a plan set. THD also had general park plans for parks, which Sanders showed, and more of which are in the Texas Roadside Park Study. These are plans for the oil derrick arbors for a rest area along Interstate 20 near Tyler. By the 1990s, TxDOT was closing older roadside parks and rest areas based on the national perception that many parks were in need of extensive maintenance and were public nuisances. Instead, TxDOT focused on developing a revised safety rest area program. This program included the replacement of older safety rest areas and the construction of new facilities along interstate highways and other major highways. Location of the new safety rest areas was based on evolving traffic patterns and urban growth along many of the state's highways. <coughs> Excuse me. The new safety rest areas received national attention due to their features such as large parking areas, exercise and playground equipment, interpretive displays, and inventive regional designs, as well as the typical restroom facilities and picnic tables. Here we have the grand opening or reopening of a couple of safety rest areas in the 1990s. Some of the problems we had then and have always had still exist today, which include trash and a lack of money for upkeep based on other priorities. Um, we still have a, several of these arched pipe picnic arbors around the state, and whenever I see them, I get a little hungry for McDonald's. <laughs> In the 21st century, TxDOT constructed safety rest areas, which include architecture reflecting regional history and culture, interpretive exhibits, staff tourist information desks, playgrounds, walking trails, and free Wi-Fi. This is to encourage folks to stop and rest a while. This safety rest area near Amarillo features architectural elements reminiscent of nearby Route 66 and its Art Deco roadside architecture. It includes walking paths and playground equipment. So for our roadside park study, once we knew the history of the parks and had a classification system of the parks and the resources, what made them significant or historic? I won't get into all the specifics of integrity and significance today but you can always go to the guide online for more information. In general, roadside parks can be significant for themes such as transportation, politics and government, social history, entertainment and recreation, distinctive architecture, or high artistic value. For a roadside park to qualify as historic, the physical features that are typical of its period of development should be retained or, and or replaced in kind when possible. Generally, a park should contain its original layout or driveway orientation, three or more picnic tables, unless it never had that many to begin with, with historic age table and bench sets, and at least one other feature, such as a fireplace or a retaining wall. We did not survey every roadside park in Texas. That would have taken too much time and money. Uh, instead, we focused on a sample survey. Of the remaining roadside parks, these shown on the map are determined historic. You can see the concentration in the Fort Davis area, what is known as the Fort Davis Loop. 
And this is the map that Sandra also showed us. This was taken from the plan sheet showing all the roadside parks that were to be constructed on the Fort Davis loop and they still exist today. And I'll leave you with images of one of our most historic roadside parks due to the integrity of the masonry craftsmanship that remains and the number of picnic tables and other resources that remain. Those that are historic will have the brown signs that you see at the bottom of the slide indicating they may not meet modern ADA or safety standards. This park receives many visitors and is well maintained, though I probably wanna, wouldn't want to drink that spring water. If you feel you have a historic roadside park in your area, based on some of what I've gone over, please let us know and we'll try to take a look at it or inventory it. Next up, Jason is going to talk about maintenance of roadside parks. Uh, so as uh, mentioned earlier, my name is Jason Dupree. I'm the director of maintenance in the Atlanta district uh, of the northeast corner of Texas. And I'm just going to spend a few minutes kind of telling you how we maintain all of these roadside parks and rest areas uh, in our current uh, environment. The first, a, uh, a wise person once told me that you uh, don't ever pass up an opportunity to talk about safety. So hopefully you've all seen this. This isn't the, a new thing for you. Uh, but TxDOT has a campaign to end the street. And that is referring to the fact that it's been over 20 years since TxDOT has had a deathless day on our highways. We average roughly around 10, it kind of fluctuates anywhere from nine and a half to 10 and a half uh, people per day that are dying in uh, crashes on our highways. We've been tasked from the Texas uh, Highway Commission to get to zero. And it's a big task, but uh, we believe we can get there. Uh, but the first step in that is, you know, you've got to go one day before you can go an entire year uh, without having any fatalities. So I would encourage y'all to talk to your friends, talk to your family. I think the main things that they can help focus on are don't drive distracted, whether that's a phone or food or music, whatever it is, don't, don't get distracted. Uh, and also don't drive impaired which should be obvious uh, why that's not a good thing. So, uh, all right, back to, uh, back to roadside parks. So there's really three categories of terms that we use in, in today's tech thought environment in the maintenance side when we're talking about these facilities. Uh, the first one we, we call just picnic areas. Uh, now that, that uh, term we use for all types of roadside facilities, it uh, doesn't matter, you know, how old they are. Uh, as has been discussed today, most of these historically were called roadside parks, uh, but today we refer to them as picnic areas, uh, mainly because one of their main features is picnic tables. Uh, there's also typically a grass area. You know, there's trees involved for, to provide shade, uh, but these picnic areas don't have any facilities, uh, you know, restroom facilities or vending machines or anything like that. And, and typically they're used, you know, it's a good place to get out and stretch your legs. Try to prevent driver fatigue, uh, let the pets, you know, go for a walk, use the bathroom, whatever they need to do. So, so the next group of areas are our safety rest areas. Uh, these are the larger, newer facilities. They in one sense, are a lot like our picnic areas. They have picnic, you know, picnic tables and grass areas, but they also have facilities, uh, restrooms, vending machines, various uh, various facilities depending on where they're at. Uh, but they are not; uh, they don't have employees working there at any time. You know, we we come in and clean those, take care of the grounds, but nobody is stationed to work at those safety rest areas. Uh, and then we have the the biggest facilities, the new, the newer facilities, and those are called travel information centers, commonly referred to as TICs. And those just continue to build on what we provide. They have picnic tables, they have grass areas, shaded areas, they have restrooms, vending machines, uh, but they also have a 
a building that uh, travelers can go in where they can get travel literature, maps, although, you know, not as necessary as they used to be, given that everybody typically has a smartphone with uh, Google Maps or whatever on it. Uh, we also provide free Wi-Fi and, and of course, restrooms and uh, you know, couches, just places to, to, to relax and get, get rested again before you get back out on the road. Uh, these facilities are also staffed by text stop travel counselors uh, who are uh, extremely knowledgeable in what Texas has to offer. You know, not just directions on how to get from point A to point B, but also uh, sites and activities, interesting locations around the state that, uh, you know, somebody that's not from Texas or not from that part of Texas may be uh, curious to know. These are uh, these travel counselors are very knowledgeable about that. And typically, you see there, uh, the ticks are staffed uh, normal business hours, eight to five, and to six o'clock during the summer. So, so going back to our picnic areas, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, kind of what maintenance activities we do and how we do it. Uh, picnic areas are maintained by the local TxDOT district. TxDOT is divided into 25 districts, and I'll have a, a map here in a second that kind of shows you how those districts are divided and how many of these facilities each district has. Uh, but typically, uh, districts handle this maintenance with contracts uh, and in-house maintenance activities. Uh, and typically, what we do is we do grounds maintenance, so mowing, uh, weed eating, raking leaves in the fall, uh, picking up litter and trash removal. Currently in the state right now, there are 550 picnic areas. Uh, and last year we spent roughly $4.6 million to maintain those 550 picnic areas, which works out to about $8,400 a year per picnic area. The safety rest areas, those are handled as far as maintenance. Uh, with contracts administered by the maintenance division, uh, which of course is housed in Austin. Uh, but they have employees kind of scattered around the state who inspect those contracts and uh, take care of take care of that those facilities. Uh, the maintenance activities they perform, again, grounds maintenance, mowing, weed eating, litter, uh, janitorial, uh, landscaping. These are safety rest areas typically have you know flower beds and uh, landscape areas that require uh, more attention to just mowing uh, and of course trash removal. Uh, right now in the state there are 84 safety rest areas uh, and last year we spent roughly 18.9 million dollars on maintenance activities uh, which works out to 225,000. So it's a considerable uh, increase in maintenance costs versus the picnic areas. Uh, the last group, the ticks, uh, those are maintained through contracts that are administered by the Travel Information Division, also out of Austin. Uh, there are currently 11 ticks in the state. Last year, we spent 5.2 million on uh, on maintaining those 11, which is 473,000 per year. Uh, again, a significant increase from the safety rest areas and picnic areas. Here's the map of the 25 districts. Uh, you can see every, every district has uh, three or more. Some districts have considerable more than others, but, but this is a facility that, that every district uh, has some responsibility in maintaining. So, so what is the expectation for us in uh, maintaining these picnic areas and, and rest areas? Uh, so first off, we're going to maintain them to keep them in proper operation. We're going to provide for safety, comfort, and convenience of the traveling public. Uh, we're going to maintain and preserve historic features. We're going to maintain clean and inviting appearance. Uh, and most of the time, that maintenance is accomplished through uh, what's called a state use contract. So the state use program uh, is set up for the employment of Texans with disabilities through community rehabilitation programs. 
Uh, they provide services and or products. And at the same time, uh, provides government agencies with a means of accomplishing work. So, typically, when we use these state use contracts, we get we get work done at fair market value, or, or sometimes less. And it provides employment for uh, Texans with disabilities. It's a really good program. These these uh, these programs provide competent workers who. Uh, we can do a good job if you if you drive around the state and you notice how good a shape these uh, picnic areas and rest areas are in. Uh, they're 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 the ones that are responsible for for maintaining and doing the actual work. Uh, and of course, this program is uh, is required by Texas law if it can be provided at fair market value. And if not, or if there if there's not a program in that area, then we would go through our normal contracting processes to put a project out to bid and, and a contractor would bid on maintaining these areas. And then occasionally, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in-house, you know, there, there are times when TechStop needs to send a crew out to pick up litter or trash, whatever the case may be. So you saw some a lot of historic pictures in the previous portion of this presentation. Uh, these two are actually current pictures. Uh, and you can tell there's there's really not a whole lot of change in what these picnic areas look like. They they pretty much look like they did, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, the one thing you may notice that picture on the left uh, that is different is the red, white, and blue trash barrel. So that uh, red, white, and blue trash barrel is kind of part of the "Don't Mess with Texas" campaign, which of course you know pushes uh, not litter. So other than that, barely unchanged in today's world. I mean, also seeing the picture on the left in the, in the back, there's a one of the historic plaques that was uh, referenced earlier. So we have a lot of uh, talented employees in TxDOT in our maintenance sections. Uh, this particular employee that, that came up with this uh, works in one of the maintenance sections in Texarkana, which is in, in my district. And just thought of, I would add this, this, this photo actually doesn't come from a picnic area, but it's a, a unique design that solved a problem. Uh, this particular trash can was getting knocked over by trucks, by 18 wheelers. And so, so he came up with a design that, uh, that would kind of solve that maintenance problem for us by, by giving a, a more sturdy installation. Uh, and also the, the lid, you know, it's a metal lid, but, but just to kind of add a, a neat feature to it, they cut out the shape of text as you can see there and, and then put it on hinges so that that's the lid to open up the trash in. Uh, design has worked well. Uh, it's obviously with the delineators, they can see it. Nobody's running into it. And, uh, you know, anything we can do that kind of dresses up some of our areas and, and makes them interesting to, to look at is always, a, is always a good thing. So as far as how the public can help with uh, maintenance of these areas, uh, first off, uh, hopefully you know, and if you don't, uh, we have an Adopt a Highway program. This program allows volunteers. Typically, you would, they adopt stretches of state maintained roads and they conduct litter pickups. Of course, we don't we don't allow that on interstate because of the uh, high traffic volumes and uh, we, we just don't want uh, you know, the general public out there on those roads. Uh, but, but they adopt a two mile stretch for two years uh, and you agree to pick up litter four times a year. Uh, and then we'll put a sign up that has your your group's name or your if it, just a person that adopts it their name. Um, it's good, good advertising for you know a Rotary Club or a Boy Scout troop or you know whoever adopts. It's, you know it's good advertising to get their name out there, uh, and it provides a good service for us by you know assisting us with with uh, litter pickup. For location specific agreements, which would, um, you know, could could be done more for you know picnic area. Uh, 
we can do location specific agreements with a civic organization, you know, Rotary Club, Club, Lions Club, groups like that, uh, garden clubs, other volunteer groups. Uh, and, and on this one, you could, you could do it for litter pickup, but you could also come up with an agreement to establish and maintain landscaping. So if you have a picnic area that you're interested in, uh, make it prettier, you know, and whatever the case may be, uh, contact the local textile office or the district office uh, that, that's over that area to discuss options for entering an agreement like that. Uh, and then, of course, use the roadside parks. Uh, we, we spend a lot of money, as I showed earlier, uh, on maintaining these parks and rest areas and, and ticks. And they really are meant to be used. You know, we, uh, we don't want to just maintain them and keep them looking nice for no reason. So uh, it always makes us feel good when we're, when we're out driving around and, and see folks actually using these picnic areas, uh, stretching their legs, having a picnic. Uh, obviously, when you're there, don't litter, though. That kind of uh, defeats the purpose and just creates more work for us and, and makes uh, Texas look dirty. And we don't, uh, we don't want that. So this slide, um, of course, has our contact information for the, the three of us that uh, did portions of the presentation today. Feel free to contact us with any questions you have later on. Uh, this picture of Texas Highways, that's a magazine that's put out. Hopefully, hopefully you all know what it is. You have a, a subscription or you, or you look at it online. Uh, it just so happened that one of the recent editions uh, talked about the return of car culture. And, and of course, the picnic areas and roadside parks play the, play a large part in that car culture. So uh, interesting issue if you, if you want to go out there and, and find a copy of that. So, thank uh, you, Jason. And thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> thank you, Jason and Sandra and Renee for your fantastic presentations. Lots of good historical imagery. Um, they make me want to hit the road and, and go explore the state now that people are getting vaccinated and everything's hopefully returning to normal over the summer months. Um, we've got a few questions already entered into our Q&A box and the chat. Don't be shy. Please send them through. Um, I will ask the first one, and this is for um, probably more historian-leaning presenters. Um, how much did the National Park Service rustic architecture influence roadside park architecture? And was there New Deal funding involved in the development of these parks in the 30s? So Sandra and Renee, if you want to join on camera and speak to that a little bit. Well, I can uh, speak to the part of the, the materials that we use. So for instance, the drawings of the picnic tables, um, the stone ones and the, um, the timber ones, those definitely were uh, influenced by the National Park Service and what they were doing also at the same time. And um, as kind of as a sideline to that, the state parks in Texas also kind of started doing their improvements around this time period too. And they also were following uh, that mode. And a number of um, the landscape architects that were attracted to the state parks were uh, in some um, to employment with the state parks were in some means or manner um, had connections to the federal, the, the national park system at that time. And they were sharing information and details. For instance, I think it was, isn't it out in New Mexico or something, uh, Renee, where the, the headquarters was. And we have some information on, on um, the head guy of uh, national parks in New Mexico coming into Texas and talking to the architects and uh, landscape architects during um, this time period and working with them on, for instance, on uh, the building of Indian Lodge and Bastrop State Park, there's some documentation of them interacting a lot. Um, but as far as funding, um, Renee, do you know more about the New Deal funding besides what I mentioned, the brief thing I mentioned? Yeah, we definitely did get, um um 
studio funding for these the construction of, of the parks in that time period. Um, we also had a question about um, what someone believes was the second roadside park built by a New Deal program, the National Youth Administration, um, Kirksey Springs. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that one. Um, they are basically asking that there's maybe um, a plaque near the springs, but there's no other signage along US 287 near that park. So um, I don't know if you know anything about that park or maybe can add some more details about the NYA involvement with roadside park development. I am not familiar. I am not familiar with that one. Where is it? What county is it in? I... Um, hmm. Doesn't say maybe he'll give some more information. Um, Kirk got a big state to cover. So I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of a lot of territory. Okay, well, I'll hold off on that and we'll see if he can add some more information. Um, another question, maybe more for you, Sandra, what species of trees and shrubs were planted in some of the early roadside parks? Oh, gosh, um, I wish I'd repeat myself on that again <laughs> recently, <laughs> but we have. Um, I had mentioned those uh, the booklets that the volumes that he had produced. Um, um, Goebbels had produced over the years, you know, the 12s, the series of 12, and one of them is more uh, or has a list of all the native plants to use. And so there, there are a lot of the typical ones we still use today as native plants, you know, for instance, um, uh, cedar elms are on it and live oaks, and um, I'm trying to think of what some of the shrubs were more, um, but whoever that is, you know, I can uh, get them a copy of that if they're interested in it. Um, they, what's interesting though, too, is that on the listing, uh, if you're familiar with how plant names change or botanical names change over the years, uh, they decide that uh, a particular species is really more related to uh, another genus than uh, this genus and everything. So um, there are several names that have changed their um, botanical names over the years. So I had to get with the list and kind of even look up some of them. I, I was guessing at what they were. And then also some of the common names have changed over the years. Um, but um, they're really pretty much the typical uh, native plants that we see today being planted. I think there were a few of them that to me were a little questionable that he would have on a statewide list. Um, but that's kind of the way the native plants are today. Some things are really better in West Texas than in East Texas, more adapted to it. Uh, sure. Um, okay. I'm not a plant person, so I might be butchering these names, um, but they want to know if privet was planted. Yes, I think privets were, and that's a, um, that's a ligustrum in the ligustrum family or genus. Kind of so um, there were, and I'm assuming if you're looking at something that was considered a privet during that time period in Texas, it's really uh, considered a common privet. So it's not not like the wax leaf ligustrum we see today, uh, which is more hybridized and and more of an ornamental plant. Um, but it, it but those privets of that time had a smaller leaf and they used them as hedges. But I'm Pretty sure I remember Privet being on the list. Okay. Um, someone else commented, I'm probably going to butcher this name too. Eliagnus is a South Central Texas favorite. Eliagnus, um, yes. Eliagnus, thank yeah, you. And <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'm not a real fan. <laughs> I've never been a real fan of Eliagnus. But uh, I am thinking it might have been on that list. And that was the ones, one of the ones I'm thinking were. Um, I was kind of surprised to see on that list, but it's a good evergreen and and a, a lot of people like it, you know, because it's so durable, but it it's, um, you know, not like I said, not 1 of my favorites, but I think it was on the list. Okay, great. Um, another question here. It seems that Lady Bird Johnson might have been heavily influenced by Goebbels. Can you talk about that? Yes, I, I. See that too, and I um, that's 
I want to spend more time researching their connection. I mean, she does mention him, I think it's some articles that I've come across. And then also, uh, you know, obviously she, um, she's really the one responsible for the Highway Beautification Act uh, that LBJ, that was passed and LBJ signed into law. And um, the, I guess during that time period, I don't know how much you know about TxDOT and, and Texas Highway Department history, but there, uh, when he was president, as I understand, and after he was president, TxDOT would um, do some maintenance award or beautification awards to, um, to some of its districts. Um, it would be a competitive sort of thing. And she and LBJ would show up to give out those annual awards. Um, but I, I do know, I, you know, I'm, I went to school at the University of Texas at uh, Arlington, and uh, the, one of the professors who started the school there, uh, Dick Myrick, um, took us as graduate students on a trip to the LBJ Ranch. And he was the one who had actually designed the planting for um, LBJ Ranch and had been the landscape architect for uh, the Johnsons, I guess, in later years. So I'm not really sure when that overlapped because I was kind of surprised that maybe that Goebbels might not have been hired to do that. Um, Goebbels died in, in 76. so. I'm not really sure exactly when they might have hired Dick Myrick, but maybe at, maybe shortly after that. Okay, great. Um, I guess, Jason, a quick question for you. Um, you showed a, shared a lot of different partners that TxDOT has worked with in maintaining the rest areas and picnic areas. Um, are you aware of any volunteer opportunities with local Texas master naturalists to help control invasive plants? Uh, not specifically, but I would think that uh, the local tech stock district would be willing to uh, work with any of those groups, especially somebody that specializes in a particular, uh, you know, uh, so I would just contact that district office or uh, most counties in the state have a maintenance office. Uh, you can contact them and, and discuss options both on something like that. Yeah, I think that would be a great partnership. Um, so definitely if you are interested or have a group that you work with that has an interest in this area, um, definitely get with your TxDOT district office. Um, I'm sure we'd be happy to have the help. Okay, um, a couple questions, um, maybe for you, Renee, is there a map or another resource with the locations of now historic sites that have been taken out of service? Um, I guess, is it, I, I would say no. <laughs> um, we we do have a map of historic properties that we find or encounter in our work that we hope to um, preserve in the course of doing the highway work. Um, but as far as mapping properties that are destroyed or parks that have been closed, I don't know that there's a map of that other than you could get an old old state maps that would show locations of parks and I do often look at the old 1930s and 1950s state maps and you can see park locations on them that no longer exist. Yeah, so it might take a little digging or a happy coincidence along your road trip route. <laughs> okay, um, another question. Um, while the priority appears to have shifted from providing roadside areas on less traveled roadways, has consideration been given to provide rest and safety areas for the increased number of bicyclists on these roadways? Um, I don't know if, if anybody has heard anything about that. So, no, um, at least not in the Atlantic district. Uh, I have not uh, really seen. I mean, we we work on accommodating bicyclists, uh, providing a lane. You know, or an area for them in their travels, but uh, I haven't really, I haven't really seen anything specific to a rest area for bicyclists. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's a good question. I'm, I'm not familiar with anything. Um, let's see. One more question here. Um, is there an internal process to suggest a roadside park location during project development? 
So I'll take that one again. Um, okay. there, there's not specific to to that suggestion. However, uh, most big projects have public outreach, uh, public meetings, uh, open comment periods for public suggestions. Uh, so that would be the time to, to make a suggestion. Um, most of the most of the discussion these days, um, you know, the the maintenance division is over the safety rest area program. So they they look at a statewide level of where locations should be or uh, when when it comes time to replace a an older picnic area on the interstate with maybe a newer safety rest area. That those decisions are be made or initiated from the maintenance division in Austin. Um, but but if, if we're rebuilding a highway and we have a public meeting, that would be the time for somebody from the public to make a suggestion or ask a question about rest areas. Okay, great, good to know. Um, and we do have a comment here from a text doc colleague kind of talking back with the master naturalists um, that we have used master naturalists and TPWD, Texas Parks and Wildlife staff to preserve rare plants and seed collections in roadside parks, which is pretty cool. Um, it's just interesting to see how, you know, with sustainability, environmental concerns, things are kind of coming back around to maybe how things started out in the 1930s, um, which is just an interesting historical kind of view of things. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions, but thank you for those. Those are really great. Um, let's see. So I guess that wraps up our presentation today. Thank you again for taking some time out of your afternoon to join us and the presenters to learn a little bit more about roadside parks and TxDOT history. Um, our next roadside chat is scheduled for July, so stay tuned for that. You can always check out news and current events on our website. Um, again, use keyword beyond the road to learn more. And please take the survey about the webinar that you should receive. We want to know um, what topics you're interested in, how you like the platform, um, what you would like to see in future roadside chats. So definitely give us some feedback. And with that, again, um, thank you again for your time. And we'll see you in July.